Okay, so I've had a lot of people ask if I would be willing to go over some question using the seven principles that I have found to help people become very successful uh, when they are combating, you know, this test, the HESI. Um, and this is universal, so it doesn't matter if you're PEDS or OB, farm, fundamentals, you know, med surge, whatever that looks like exit. This applies around the gambit. Uh, because the questions are basically the same. Um, so we're going to go through them, and I don't want you to focus on the question that I'm asking. I don't want you to focus on how to answer the question. What I want you to know is nothing. I want you to come in with an open mind and an open experience, a little bit of time, some pen and a paper, and I need for you to get me seven post-it notes. I know this sounds weird. Just listen, just trust, please. So if you guys ask me to do this, I'm gonna do it right or I'm not gonna do it at all. And this is what I have to give you. So I need for you to have a notebook and a paper and pen and seven sticky notes. Those are important, the seven sticky notes. And I need for you to take this seriously because I'm going to go over this and I'm going to go over a couple of questions. But again, don't try to answer the question. Try to learn the principle of what I'm teaching you and then start applying it to your questions and then start showing up to my workshops um, that I'm doing quite often. I start usually on week three. So if you can't catch me this semester, catch me next semester. Uh, but I usually start week three. I usually start with um, this class. And then I also... Um, usually do med surge that's a pretty popular one um a lot of times my backup uh colleagues jump on that one as well so it's kind of hard to tell about that one but i usually end up picking farm and fundamentals i usually come back quite a bit um and of course the exit so pay attention i do this a lot i enjoy doing it i enjoy talking to you about it i enjoy trying to be a nerd about it because it's fun to be a nerd um i'm gonna throw a lot at you it's gonna be weird it's gonna be super weird but i need for you to just go with it because eventually what's going to happen is you're going to click into it and then you're going to really, really want to know the ins and outs of this. But I need for you to know your opponent, right? In order to be successful in something uh, the first time around is you have to learn from the experience of knowing your opponent. So the 6 a.m. is very scary in a lot of ways, but it's not. It's like learning a new language. So basically in all of the words that we're going to be looking at and delving into basically each one of these sentences that you're going to get for however many questions you get is going to say how do you not kill this person in this scenario what can you do so this person doesn't die how can you push this so that they don't go into cardiac failure and croak right in front of you that type of deal. This is how I need for you to look at the questions. So don't make it so complicated and go, oh my God, this med, oh my God, they're asking this, they're asking that. Da -da 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 -da. Stop. Just remember, the nation is at a deficit of nurses. This exam is meant to be easier. We have, unfortunately, given an opportunity for nursing to catch up to itself after what happened with COVID. So the bar is slightly lowered. But it's not slightly lowered in your ability because you were already above the bar to begin with. So I need for you to pay attention and just go with it. Because I'm going to be explaining all these things that are going on and describing the history of these questions so that you're not so afraid of it anymore. Because then we know our opponent, right? All right. I think I've said enough. Um, so let's just go ahead and start with the first principle. And uh, good luck, guys. This is about to be a wild ride, but it's going to be great. All right, so the first principle of being successful in, in choosing the correct answer is a principle called one of these things is not like the other one of these things does not belong. Now, I know that that is so ridiculously long, so I've called it OOTT. Or if we want to get super stupid, we can call it, I don't know, O squared T squared. That's disgusting. Anyways, so someone finds something better to call it. The, I just was thinking of uh, the joke of one of these things is not like the other. One of these things is not belong, right? That we learned um, in some fun rando elementary school thing, right? I remember hearing that song on TV. Uh, Schoolhouse Rock, I think, is the one that did it. 
I just aged myself. Cool. Well, digressing to me being old, frumpy dumpy. Um, this is how this works. So a post-operative client says to the nurse, my neighbor, I mean, the person in the next room sings all night and keeps me awake. The neighboring client has dementia and is awaiting transfer to a nursing home. How can the LPN best handle the situation? Now, this question specifically is multifaceted because if you notice in here, let me get my little pen. Now, nah, let me get my little writer. It says here, the neighboring client has dementia and is awaiting transfer to a nursing home. Now, here's where this gets wicked. If you are in an inpatient setting, you have got to watch this patient and keep them as calm as you can the next 24 hours because they cannot have any type of restraint for 24 hours. This nursing home will go, Eek, I'm not going to do it. So every nurse knows when they walk in the door, the bed, I don't know, 222, which is our classroom, bed 222. I don't care what you do, give them what they want, be sweet to them, be kind to them, tell them how wonderful they are, give them a bath, paint their toes, brush their hair. I don't care what you do. Keep that person in check because we are at hour 18 and this person is ready to roll out at 6.02. You got me? And everyone literally just got a direct order from their commander and they clinch up and they all work together to get through that shift. I'm not even playing. Okay. So. This is why this is going to be important in the question. I haven't even seen the answers, but I can tell you most certainly that's got something to do with it. And I will see once I look down and see what our options are, how I can do this. Oh, by the way, I'm doing this live. I picked questions as soon as I knew that that was going to be appropriate. I did not look at the question. I just looked at the answer bank. That's how well I can do this nowadays. So I looked at the answer bank, knew it was going to be one of my principles, just copied and pasted over this question, changed it up a little bit, um, and then went live. So I'm doing this with you. I figured that would be a good add on so that we can figure out how this works together. And I've done so many of them that I can't even honestly tell you what the answer is right this second. So let's see, how can the LPN best handle the situation? Got it. All right. Tell the neighboring client to stop singing. Nope. That's gone. Ank. Why? Because that's just a jerk move and no state funded hippy dippy we're all in this together organization called i don't know the ohio board of nursing is gonna think that that is a good thing to throw around the gate that's a no that's just no this is part of the common sense kind of deal all right b close the doors to both clients rooms at night well no because uh one of them has da -da 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 dementia told you it was gonna happen and we're uh, uh waiting transfer so we gotta listen really really close boom i told you it was coming back i told you so no, this is a terrible answer. Go away. All right, give the complaining client the prescribed as needed sedative. Yowzers. No, no, we're not gonna give the client the prescribed as needed sedative because the post-operative client says to the nurse, my neighbor, I mean the person in the next room, sings at night to keep me awake. All right, we're not sedating anybody in this situation because that's a chemical restraint, especially not this guy. So it sounds like we're talking about the client, which I think is the post-operative client, which is the other person, but I'm not giving them a sedative either because think about it. All I'm doing is chemically restraining them and making them go to sleep. So I'm going to say that by default, D is going to be our answer and move the neighboring client to a room at the end of the hall. Yeah, this is completely over at the other side of baseline for these other three. I mean, think about it. Tell them to stop singing. Hey, shut up. Right. All right. Not cool. It's close both doors to the both of the clients' rooms at night. One of them's got dementia. That's harmful. This one right here, this is harmful to their psyche. This is harmful to the psyche. Complaining client prescribed, yeah, sedative, harmful to the psyche. So all these things are going to upset this client or patient, whatever we want to call them. And the only thing that makes sense is move them so that we can create peace. Okay, done. One of these things is not like the other. One of these things does not belong. 80% of your questions are going to do this, I promise you. Just watch. Just watch. All right, next slide. Okay, again, I'm gonna go ahead and get my little pencil here because it looks like we're gonna have to do the same thing. So we already know the answer C, but I'm not worried about that again. Don't worry about the questions, just worry about the format and what's happening. So the nurse is providing post-operative care to a client who's had submucosal resection or an SMR for a deviated septum. All right, so deviated septum's nose, got it, all right? The LPN should monitor for what complication associated with this type of surgery. Now, 
an occipital headache. The occiput is in the back of the head. And if it's in the back of the head, then that's not the front of the head. So that wouldn't make any sense. So that's a no. Preorbital crepitus. All right, well, again, preorbital crepitus is not in the area or location that would be at the site of the surgical procedure, which would be around the septum or the nose or the nasal passage or cavity, potentially, depending on what it is exactly um, that they've had to chisel into. So either way, not in the same proximity. All right, expectoration of blood. Well, that makes sense because if you get punched in the nose and you bleed and you're standing, then where does it go? It goes and goes down to your throat and then you cough it up because it gags you. So expectoration of blood makes sense. Uh, changes in vocalization. Well, no, because the problem again is in the nose, not into the throat that's farther down. So again, a, this is a matter of one of these things is not like the other. One of these things does not belong. In this case, what doesn't belong is the action doesn't make sense to the location of where the action is, is being uh, made, right? So if you have a headache in the occiput, that's got nothing to do with having a resection for a deviated septum but what does is you know the fact that they just cut into you and your nose is going to bleed and if it bleeds and you stand to go to the bathroom it's all going to come crashing down and then you're going to cough it up right so that's kind of how this works and i hope i explained that well enough so we'll move to the next slide all right so the principle of passive versus active so here's how i want you to look at this Passive versus active. Passive means what I'm doing for the patient is going to cause a delay in care. Active means I am actively going to do something that is going to create immediacy, some type of immediate action that is going to change the current dynamic or environment around me related to the patient. All right, so that's how we have to look at this. So. The LPN is preparing discharge instructions for a client who has begun to demonstrate signs of early Alzheimer's dementia. The client lives alone. Yikes, let's go ahead and underline alone. Let's go ahead and underline Alzheimer's. What, what? These are my trigger words. Trigger words are words to let us know which way the flow of the questions are going to try to deviate. All right, so here's how I look at these questions. And again, my brain is wired completely different. So if you can't do it, cool. But here's how I look at it in my head. It's like one of those uh, follow the tunnel things that you get uh, at a doctor's office that they have like a maze or whatever, and you have to find the start and the finish. That's kind of how this works. It's the flow of a question will lead you to the type of answer they're looking for to begin with. So the client lives alone and has Alzheimer's. Already I hear danger and danger. All right, now the client's adult children live nearby. Oh boy, I know what that means. That translates in the hospital world to I'm five doors down the road but I got five kids of my own who got school and lacrosse and friends and sleepovers and proms and I check on her every Sunday after church while I'm driving by that's what that could potentially stand for because many times that's exactly what it stands for so that's scary also so again danger wah wah trigger words trigger phrases all right according to the prescribed medication regimen the client is to take medications <laughs> six times throughout the day. All right, so Alzheimer's alone, adult children live nearby and six times throughout the day. Do you see how much this really works? Here's what they do. They put a bunch of fluff in between the words that you need. I hope that you can see this. It's kind of a joke, haha. -ha. If the question is too easy at the level that they wrote it, then they had to put a bunch of fluff and stuff in between so that it tastes a little bit better and the level of people answering it correctly will go down, right? So that they're within their range that they have to write these questions so they're not easy but not too hard, right? Think of your opponent. This is who your opponent is, a person who is a statistician and a master, master puppeteer when it comes to perception of the mind. So get into their head a little bit. It's a little bit fun. So Alzheimer alone, adult children live nearby six times throughout the day. I don't even, I haven't even read the rest of the question. If medications come into play, which it probably will, based off of what I see in the answer bank, then I'm not gonna be surprised. What is the priority nursing intervention to assist the client right would take a medication boom there it is we're concerned because this dude 
is going to be non-compliant for about 15 different reasons, right? And about 15 other different environmental factors. We could create a lot of scenarios in our head. So what do we do? Contact the client's children to ask them to hire a private duty aide who will provide around the clock care. Okay, Sally who sells seashells by the seashore who has five kids is not going to be able to afford $20 an hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of this man's life. Let's be real. So that's a no-no. Develop a charting for the client. Listing the times the medication should be taken. Cool. Does he remember, uh, does he remember how to read? Like I know it's early Alzheimer's, but early Alzheimer's, they pretty much forget where they put everything, right? So if you create a chart, it better be a chart that is strapped down and nailed down. Otherwise, he, they may even forget to look at it. Early Alzheimer's, they may go, man, I'm supposed to be doing something in here. And then they get caught up because the squirrel, I don't know, they saw it outside and they went to go do that. And then it doesn't matter that the chart's there. That's early Alzheimer's and it is what it is. I'm not making fun. I'm just being honest. That's the dynamic. So that's not a good idea. That's a terrible idea. Contact the primary health care provider and discuss the possibility of simplifying the medication regimen. Yes, I like the sound of that because if I can win anywhere in the world, I can win and not making somebody take something six times a day because I, I can't even keep up with six times a day and I'm completely competent, obviously. There's no way I'm going to keep up with that because life happens when you're making plans. So yeah, I like that answer the best so far. Instruct the client and the client's children to put medications in a weekly pill organizer. Again, he's going to forget where it's at. If it could be moved, he's going to forget. If it can't be moved and it's anchored down, then he's going to forget to walk that way. I mean, come on. We know, we know how this goes. So this is how the flow of the question goes. Just by those words that I have underlined, you can clearly distinguish an answer looking in there because of passive action versus active action. A, B, and D are all going to delay care in the bigger problem. The bigger problem is, is medication compliance and the concern for it, especially when it's six times throughout the day. That's nuts. Nuts. So that is how we do passive versus active. That is how we choose the answer based off of the principles of delaying care versus immediacy. Let's go to the next slide. All right, friends, I like this question. Here's why. Here's another take on passive versus active. Remember, just very quickly, passive versus active means one is going to create immediacy while the other is going to create a delay in the care or the coordination of the care. So let's go into this one. 24 hours after a cesarean birth, a client elects to sign herself and her baby out of the hospital. Staff members are unable to contact her health care provider. The client arrives at the nursery and asks that her infant be given to her to take home. What is the most appropriate nursing action? Well, let's see. Give the infant to the client and instruct her regarding the infant's care. That's going to be a good answer because, and I'm not looking at the other ones yet, that's going to be a good answer because I'm creating an action immediately that is going to also detain temporarily the mother because if I'm instructing her, then I can go ahead and vocera. <coughs> I can go ahead and give someone the all clear or the panic button to let them know they need to come in here. Somebody needs to be getting on the horn with the doc. I don't care. Someone needs to be calling a resident. I don't care if they're sleeping right now downstairs and they're in their little mini apartment in the basement. Go wake them up. I don't care what's going on. This is what needs to happen. So I like, I like this answer. All right. Explain the client that she can leave, but her infant must remain in the hospital. Oh, wow, 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 wow. I hear a lawsuit. I hear a thousand lawyers cupping their hands in their head, rocking back and forth in a crisscross applesauce fashion going, no, because that my friends is a big problem. You don't separate the two of them. You can't. You don't own that baby. That baby is not yours. You did not carry it. I am so sorry. You have to You have to do it a certain way. And the baby's going to stay here with me is not the answer. I'm sorry. It's not. We have to diffuse, diffuse, diffuse. Okay? If I can stall that baby and that mama long enough to get somebody up there that is bigger than I am, then that group of authority in itself when they come walking into the door with white coats is going to set the precedence that they are not playing and she needs to sit herself down 
and they need to have a big discussion to find out what's going on with this patient now. Okay. So, so far, B's a joke, C, let's see. Emphasize to the client that the infant is a minor and legally must remain until prescriptions are received. Also, yikes, that's a big presumptive sentence. A presumptive sentence that we don't know for sure because we haven't checked hospital protocol because this isn't the same in any hospital setting to my knowledge. I'm going to have to give it a Google later and maybe change the slide, but I don't think I'm wrong, which means if I didn't change it, then I'm right. Um, I don't know entirely what this looks like, but either way, it's going to create animosity with the patient. And we might be in a situation where we snatch and duck and then it gets really ugly and that's unnecessary. So this is all about diffusion. So even if you don't know, which honestly, I don't know because I don't know how it works because I don't work in baby land. Um, but just from a Amber Alert perspective, I think I could see where that would go haywire really quick. Even if someone didn't know and as a nurse, I would think that you guys would need to know in that department because it's an obvious, but as a regular nurse, I don't know. So as a baseline nurse, I wouldn't think that that would even be a factor. So again, I'm going through a matter of diffusion is the way I'm thinking we're doing this. D, tell the client that the hospital policy prevents the staff from releasing the infant until she's ready for his discharge. Yikes. Again, I, I see the only positive option between B, C, and D. B, C, and D is going to create a legal swirl of events that's going to go really bad really fast, regardless of what right or wrong looks like. A is going to diffuse the situation. This is a matter of diffusion. Also fits principle number one, one of these things is not like the other, one of these things does not belong, because again, B, C, and D fit the mold model of uh, creating an escalation versus a diffusion. So A is your answer, and let's go to the next one. All right, so principle three, no all, no never. So this one is kind of a side thing that I've noticed, and I've only ever found one exception to this rule of every time I've ever ran into this. So here's the concept. There's never going to be a point at any of your exams, with the exception of the one rule that I'm going to give you. There's never going to be a point in the exam where all is going to be the answer, ever. Never, 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 right? We can argue this until the cows come home if you want. I can tell you my two cents on this. It's accurate. It's accurate, and it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. It's an accurate statement. So for the purposes of this exam, at least, there is no all. There is no never, okay? So there's one conditional, and the conditional is if you ever get a question about patient safety goals. Now, if our goal is to have all patients cared for in the same type of equality da, 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 manner, that's the only exception. Any other instance, anytime you see all right here, knock it out. It doesn't exist. The reason it doesn't exist is because in medicine you can never say all for anything first off. And let's look at this. After accepting the position of school nurse in a public elementary school, which strategy is best for the nurse to use to obtain an overview understanding of the student body? Now, here's what I got. Overview understanding. After accepting a position. And we're trying to understand the student body. So, after accepting a position, we need an overview understanding of the student body. We're not going to review all health records to get that. That's nuts. How many students are in a school? I don't know, like 1,600? You guys have to be pulling all that? You're probably not going to have all of them anyway. Someone's done lost something. Lois, who was there before you, done got mad. She done strode everything about. You got to get everything back to alphabetize again. Like, I'm just saying. This is the reality of our life. I'm just, like, it is what it is. It's a lot. But I'm painting a picture here for a reason, because this is the stuff that happens all the time. So I hate that answer. And it's because the word all is in there. There's no such thing as all. There's no such thing as never. Again, if you want to argue this with me, I have some pretty solid points that might just blow your mind. But right now is not the time. So just leave it be. In the case of this examination, I've never seen a question other than what I previously described. Where the answer all or the answer never, again, unless we're relating to something like safety, right? If we never want to hurt somebody, duh, right? But large in part, this is how it rolls. Get rid of it. 
you'll find that some of these questions have one or two alls in it, or maybe even three. So don't do it. It's not worth it. I'm telling you. All right, next slide. And again, we have another example here. So no all, no never continued. When asked to help develop interventions to combat obesity amongst children, the community health nurse should stress the importance of implementing which activity. So let's see. Developing interventions to combat obesity for my kids. The community health nurse. Remember, no all, no none. I've never seen a no all, no none question that applies that doesn't have to do with community nursing or standards of care or, you know, some basic management kind of modality, right? That's when they usually use these blanket statements about all. So here, what is the importance or what is the importance of implementing which activity? Requiring all children? I'm sorry, you're not requiring all children to do anything. You're just asking for trouble. Provide diet classes for obese children during school hours. Oh, yikes. We're not going to set them up either. Develop strict diet plans for school-aged children. Again, this is an all statement for school-aged children. So that's an all. So again, all, all. If we got two alls, neither of those are good. They cancel each other out. Set goals that are focused on developing healthier lifestyles. Yeah, duh. Right? Duh. Notice there wasn't an all in this one, though. Notice they didn't say for all students. For all school-aged children. Notice they didn't do that. Why? Because it might have confused your perception of these two alls with this all. And they separate these things. It is one of these things is not like the other. One of these things does not belong. This absolutely applies to that rule as well. You can see it here very clearly. Right? Here we're making it all, here we're singling out, here we're making it all. One of these things is not like the other, one of these things does not belong. So there you go. I hope that makes sense to you. Let's go to the next slide. So number four principle in a lot of ways is my most important principle because it is going to get you through life in general. The idea of parasympathetic versus sympathetic, it is a process by which your body produces and dumps hormones and works accordingly to either speed you up or slow you down based off of what's going on around you in your environment and the triggers that you receive from those, uh, those sensory receptors, right, from the outside world. So basically how this works is your brain has two states of flux and there's a lot more in between but in this one little narrow niche i need for you to understand just this very simple situation parasympathetic and sympathetic are like uh joy and fear all right cool i like this let's go with this brain blast all right so there is a movie that is made by a company that has two characters one of which is named joy one of which is named fear there's also one named anger um and there's also one named disgust eh, i can't remember they were like side character anyways digressing so this is like joy and fear all right so joy would be the parasympathetic process i'm resting i'm digesting i feel copacetic i'm sitting on the beach Life is peachy. So in that case, what happens is your heart is relaxed and calm. So your heart rate is lower than it normally is. Your uh, perception of thoughts and abstract conceptual thinking is uh, fully functional. Your respirations are from 12 to 22 and normal. Uh, peristalsis in your intestines is working and running. So, you know, things are moving down the pipeline as they should. Uh, let's see what else here. Pupils, they're, they are normal, uh, equal and reactive to light and accommodation as usual. Nothing super exciting there. Blood pressure is stable. All right. When we go into sympathetic, we go into Freddy and Jason from the 80s horror movies and the clown from that It movie that freaks me out because, wow. I mean, just where do you begin with that? It's just such a mess in so many different levels, 
right? They're all chasing you in the middle of the dark woods and you keep tripping over sticks and they're barely even breaking a sweat and you can barely even make yourself get up without falling because you're just so frightened with fear. Now let's look at the, what that is. So your blood pressure obviously is elevated. Your respirations are obviously elevated. Um, you are irrational in your thought process, right? Like I'm getting palpitations just thinking about having palpitations, that type of a deal. Your pupils are dilated so that you could try to save yourself, right? The, you don't have time to pee and poop. So paracelsus is shut down. It don't care. It's, it's not even a thing right now, right? So things of that nature happen. So we need to know this because if we know one, we know how to reverse it. Because again, there's a balance in this world. This world is all about energy, frequency, and vibration. And this exam is going to be no different, right? So the nurse is caring for a three-month-old boy. One day after pylorostomy notices that the infant is restless, is exhibiting facial grimaces, and is drawing his knees to his chest. Wait, let me go back. One day after. All right, he's probably in pain. Now, here's where we get into weird territory because I don't do the baby situation. I'm not a specialist or not even cool in that area. If I brush up on it, I can learn a fair amount. It would take me, eh, I don't know, a couple of days. But why would I need to do that when there are perfectly good people who can do that on their own? You guys, you guys can read and do this because I stay out of baby land because I prefer to stay out of baby land. So, that being said... To me, being a regular rando nurse, I think this person's in pain because all of those things sound like pain actions that I've seen from babies. All right, remember this is about the bottom line nurse. So I have a choice here. I can go with something very unusual or I could go with something very simple. And this exam, and the reason I said all those silly things that I just said, remember everything I do is for a calculated reason, is to let you know that their intention is for the baseline nurse to be able to answer this question. So is it normally going to be anything super crazy? No, because in baby land, they are much like I am. Everyone shuns baby land unless it's baby land. So everyone that sees this question is going to think, oh my God, it's a baby land question. So they're going to make it nice and slow and easy for you. All right. Don't make it overcomplicated. Don't do it. It's there. Facial grimaces, pain, drawing knees to chest, pain, restless, pain. I do all those things. Got to watch out for that. And it was one day after. So even if I don't know if it's some rando disease, what I do know is a day after a three month old who's just old enough to really, really, really suck at feeling pain. Like that's when they get really loud is when they hit three months because they're really starting to understand that there is a world out there and they live in it, right? And then they had a pyelorostomy. Now, whether we know what that is or not, we know that something's been removed. So there's going to be sutures internally and externally, and there's going to be movement that they're not going to be able to make without pain. If we're restless and we're exhibiting a facial grimacing. Sorry, I'm actually drawing these. I don't know if you're going to see it live, but I'm like drawing them live. He draws his knees to his chest. God, these are the worst lines ever. All right, cool. What action should the nurse take? So A is the answer for this one. We want to administer a prescribed analgesia for pain because he's in pain. We don't have any indicator for rehydration. We don't have any indicator for being cold or an indicator for hypoglycemia. So that's it. In six minutes, that was a lot to take in. Boom. But there you go. All right, next slide. Now people fight me with this question every time I show this question. I don't know why people fight me with this question so much. So, a client who is in hospice care complains of increasing amounts of pain. All right. The healthcare provider prescribes an analgesic every four hours as needed. Which action should the LPN implement? All right, cool. So here's the argument I always have. Everyone always wants to make it be. And I get that. That's so cool because we have an order every four hours is needed so we got a prn cool so they're in increased amounts of pain let's back up and do a little bit of history hospice care it doesn't say palliative it says hospice which means they're going to be gone pretty soon when we go to hospice we go to six months or less right it doesn't say how long but what we do know is that a client who is in hospice care has increased amounts of pain what hospice patient in God's green earth? Think about this for a second. You ever want to be in pain? No. No, no, no. The healthcare provider prescribes an analgesic every four hours as needed. What action are you going to do? Well, 
What are our options? Let's see. Give the around-the-clock schedule for administration of analgesics. All right. All right. That's good because right now we have increasing amounts of pain. We're a hospice patient. So we've signed everything that we need to do. When you go from palliative care to hospice, a lot of times you have to go full on like DNR type of decisions. So this person's in pain. I like I keep saying it over and over because I'm trying to get you to understand the, the background behind this question. All right. And while they're creating a pain regimen that decreases that pain, you're going to give it around the clock. Administer analgesic medication is needed when the pain is severe. Okay, cool. Why would we wait until the pain is severe? What in the heck are you doing? It takes 45 minutes for a pain pill to hit a person. That's if they have a normal metabolism. This person's hospice, which means everything is slowed because the body is slowing down so that it can transition to the other world. Duh. Duh. So why would we make them be in severe pain and wait and take medicine? That's crazy. Provide medication to keep the client sedated and aware of the stimuli. Oh, cool. So let's just make it happen sooner. Like, I'm sorry. Why? Why? Some of you might be laughing. Some of you might be shocked. But regardless, you're all thinking what I'm thinking. I'm just not afraid to say it. So this is how I need for you to look at this question. This is fifth grade in color in books, guys fifth grade in color in books. Again, we don't even need the whole question. All we need are the words hospice care, increasing amounts of pain, prescribes analgesic every four hours. It's not working. So make it work by giving it. I'm still at A. I'm still loving A. Uh, hate C. That's the worst. Offer a medication free period so that the client can do daily activities. Sure. We're having increasing amounts of pain. So here's what we're going to do to comfort the hospice patient. We're going to go, hey, guess what? I've decided you're not going to get nothing here. Have some rice pudding. Like really? Gross. So A is the answer. It's an obvious answer. It fits principle number one. One of these things is not like the other. One of these things does not belong. It fits principle number two, passive versus active, right? So I'm 100% certain, and I do know for sure, um, that A is the answer for this one. So good job listening through that. I hope it helped. And then we'll go to the next slide. So this is also a fun principle. This is the principle of energy, frequency, and vibration. I love me some Nikola Tesla. I'm actually probably going to change this later on and make it principle number three just because it's fair. It's an inside joke to any of my super big nerds. But it's five for right now because it was the fifth one I found. Um, so for that reason, it became five. Uh, so yeah, energy, frequency, and vibration. So the whole world. The whole world and everything around it works off of this. My entire ability to function in a day, right, it balances off of this concept. If it weren't for my receptiveness to the energy, frequency, and vibrational patterns around me, I would be non-functional more than likely. It would be that terrible because I really don't know how to communicate and tell people the things that I want to tell people if it weren't for um, my ability to know when I'm tossing a line and making somebody uncomfortable because I never want that for anybody and I have nothing to hide in the world so I'm happy to explain it but between what my mouth says and what my face looks like I'm saying it gets a little dicey in between so there there you go so energy frequency and vibrational pattern is everywhere if you can receive it and you can transmute it it's that simple so let's see how this works. What does this all mean? You crazy cuckoo saying these crazy things. A 26 year old female client is admitted to the hospital for treating a simple goiter and levothyroxine sodium or synthroid is prescribed. Which symptoms indicate to the nurse that the prescribed doses is too high for the client? All right, cool. Well, we got some big words in here. I have the word goiter. I have the word synthroid. And then I have the word dosage is too high for patient. All right. So in this case, when we have too much, I know whether you know endocrine well or not, you should know the basics. So here are the basics. Too much Synthroid means things are going to go up really high, really fast. Okay. This puts us in a sympathetic nervous system state. 
And since we just talked about principle number four, that's cool because now you are ready for this. So you see how this is applicable to everything that you do around you. So a goiter indicates that something was too big and we need to stop that. So we have Synthroid and Synthroid that's too high is going to make someone have palpitations. So A is the common answer. However, you don't know any of these things in this scenario. So here we go. Palpitations, shortness of breath. Okay, that sucks. Is that high vibration or is it a low vibration? That is a high vibration. That that is high. That's annoying me. If it's annoying me and giving me anxiety, that's a high vibration. Okay. If it's anxiety or elation, it's a high vibration. How about that? All right. Bradycardia and constipation. Hmm. Well. Now that things say bradycardia, and it's weird. Part of what my brain does is when I read a word, I it's it's a, there's a color and there's a feeling associated with it. So when I read the word bradycardia, I literally start talking a little bit slower. Constipation, that's uncomfortable. Things are slowing down because things aren't moving like they're supposed to. So that's a slow vibration. That's a low vibration. Okay. Lethargy and lack of appetite. Oh, snap. Oh, snap. That was the one that was going to break it. Now I have two things that are parasympathetic, lethargy and lack of appetite. And again, this is parasympathetic, not in the sense of normalcy. This is hyper parasympathetic. That way, uh, so what that means is we are beyond the level of parasympathetic and we are now into the negative of a parasympathetic situation. So this would be the hypersensitivity of parasympathetic process. I hope I didn't confuse you it basically means I'm completely like cool versus I just got knocked in the head and I'm dizzy all right now we're over on that line all right so two things are in the negative which means by default this one that's below me that I'm not even looking at is probably also going to be negative which means that's positive and positive fits the principle of high energy frequency and vibrational pattern versus low 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 also principle number one uh, also principle number four, also principle. No, yeah, if it's okay. Yeah, this is definitely the answer done. And then D is muscle cramping and dry flush skin. Yeah, because we are dehydrated, which means things are low, low vibration done. I hope that helped. I hope that helped for sure. So let's go to the next slide. Okay. So let's do another one about energy frequency and vibrational. Uh, themes in the question. So let's see. Chlorpromazine has been described or prescribed to a patient with Huntington's disease for relief of uh, choriform movements. Now, I know you don't know what choriform movement says. It's cool. Here's what it is. Basically, what happens in Huntington's disease, which is probably one of the worst ways, wow, by far one of the worst ways uh, to pass on, where everything's perfectly fine until you hit your mid 30s, find out that you have a neuromuscular degenerative disorder where you slowly turn into a small child even though you are completely conscious and aware on the inside i mean you get a yikes that's terrible all right so we know automatically this is going to be a part of depression of brain activity knowing that this is a neuromuscular neurodegenerative uh, disease process right Sorry, I had to pause for a sip of drink. So, we know that we need to do something that is going to affect us in the matter of the brain, right? So, I would expect things to slow down because that's what this medication does. Even if you don't know the medication, we know with Huntington's, things are they're slowing down, right? So, what are our options? Our options are a headache photophobia and urinary frequency now as far as vibrational pattern is concerned a headache is pounding a headache creates excitability if it creates excitability this is a higher vibrational pattern okay photophobia I'm in neurosensory overload and my vision is suffering from it if it's a neurosensory overload we are in a sympathetic nervous system which means we are at a higher vibration right think about the vibrations that you feel when lights are too bright and in your eyes and your head starts pounding because of it think about it you're not low at that moment you're pissed off and high 
because it's just dull enough to feel like somebody's stabbing you, but just bad enough to where you almost can't get up and go get medicine. Like, you know what I mean? That That is not low vibration. That is pounding me in the head vibration. You don't forget that stuff, all right? Urinary frequency, same deal. Get up, move around, go potty. Get up, you move around, go potty. Get up, get up, get up. Urinary frequency. It's a higher annoyance. Now, drowsiness, on the other hand, not only is it one of these things is not like the other one of these things is not belong, but this, A, has to do with uh, a response to brain chemistry being changed or shut down, right, by way of medication. And on top of it, um, the energy frequency and vibration of that word, drowsiness, is low, where, whereas everything else was excitability, right? It was pounding headache, boom, 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 boom. It's photophobia, right? Like, close the curtains like a vampire. It's like, right? That type of a deal. Urinary frequency, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, gotta go, right? And then drowsiness, like Eeyore, thanks for noticing me, right? So drowsiness is the answer, and that's why. So hopefully that helps clarify uh, how energy frequency and vibration is so important to um, understanding how to crack the code to this examination because you can and will do it. So next slide. All right, principle six, can you elaborate? This is a good one. This one happens a lot. And this one happens a lot with people who are struggling with testing because they see this question, they see a whole bunch of things that are all there and their brain automatically goes into limbo with, oh God, I don't even know what's wrong with this person. I don't even know what to do with this person and what's wrong and da 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 da. Stop. Just listen. All right. When you see all this stuff, remember principle six. Can you elaborate? So let's do it together. A client with a history of bilateral adrenalectomy. That's pretty important. I'm going to throw that in there. Ooh, that was ugly. Let's erase that. A kind, oop, oop, oop. There we go. All better. All right, let's try. Okay, good. Let's try it again. Uh, and let's W E A K. I don't know what that happened for, but there, there's that. Irregular pulse. That's important. And hypotension, also important. Things are going haywire. Which is this one? Warrants immediate intervention by the nurse. All right. Uh, decrease urinary output. Uh, how much? Can you elaborate? Do you see what I'm doing here? You can't tell me? I don't know. Decrease urinary output. Am I decreased from normally doing 3,000 3, milliliters a day? And now I'm at, like, I don't know, 2,800 milli milliliters a day? Well, I mean, come on. Uh, low blood glucose level. Okay, cool. Is it 20? Is it 50? Is it 60? Is it a high diabetic with an 85? And he's feeling like his sugar's a down. Like, I don't know. What, what are you going to tell me here? Profound weight gain. All right, cool. Are you a CHF patient and you were 10 pounds heavier the next morning? Or are you a supermodel who, you know, had a midday snack and you gain eight ounces? Like, I have no idea. Oh, profound weight gain. But profound weight gain, what does that mean? Does that mean 30 pounds? Does that mean 60 pounds? Does that mean 10 pounds? Define profound. Define profound. Or uh, ventricular arrhythmias. Yeah, that one's pretty obvious. I know what a ventricular arrhythmia looks like. That's a bad day. That's going to be my go-to. That did elaborate. Like, can you elaborate on an arrhythmia? Yeah. Uh, VTAC. <laughs> VFib. <laughs> cool. All right. I'm not going to argue with that. Awesome. Done. So that's that one. All right, next slide. All right, let me get my little pen drawer. So here's our other can you elaborate. So a client is receiving an intravenous infusion of Alteplase, uh, for which adverse effect of the medication does the nurse monitor closely? Um, so this is a big question for which one of these is bad? And hearing loss, can you elaborate hearing loss? Is it slight hearing loss? Is it profound hearing loss? Right? Like, what does that look like? Can you elaborate? Bleeding. Bleeding is our correct answer, FYI. Um, bleeding, bleeding of any type is never good. Right? 
unless it's scheduled bleeding, right, with, you know, things like bloodletting and the hemochromatosis. That's, that's good bleeding. However, bleeding is bleeding, right? Decrease urine output. How much? Like, can you elaborate? Is it 100 milliliters? Is it less than 100 milliliters in 24 hours? Is it decrease urine output by like 75%, 10%? I mean, what's the deal? Increase blood pressure. Okay, cool. Increase to what? Are we, are we systolic 129 or are we systolic, you know, 229? Big difference. So again, when you don't have a full answer, kick them off. They don't, they don't exist. They don't exist. Increase blood pressure. Cool. Question mark. That's actually not a terrible question mark. Same deal. Decrease your output. Okay, cool. If we needed to know these things, they would have told us. This helps us get to where we need to go. Hearing loss. Uh, what exactly does hearing loss look like to you? Right? But bleeding. Bleeding is bleeding is bleeding is bleeding is bleeding. That's never good. All right. Next slide. All right. Let me get my little writing tool out. All right. So this is principle number seven. Uh, principle number seven was actually found by a student who is absolutely fantastic, which is what I call her for a nickname. Um, so... Yeah, I'm going to do my best to explain this. She does a better job, but I get it. So here we go. Principle seven, left, right, and center. Uh, during evacuation, so I'm going to evacuation. That's important. A group of clients from medical unit because of fire. The nurse observes an ambulatory client walking because that's what ambulatory clients do alone towards the stairway at the end of the hall. Which action should the nurse take? And we'll do stairway. All right, so assign a UAP to transport the client via a wheelchair. Okay, first off, why am I wasting wheelchairs when I got people that can't walk? Second off, why am I wasting a UAP that could be, I don't know, tossing some bodies up over her shoulder like fireman style and, you know, saves the citizen? What are we doing here? Why are we wasting, why are we wasting good people when this guy fully walks? All right, so I'm going to say A is not the answer. All right, remind the client to walk carefully down the stairs until reaching a lower floor. <gasps> oh, abs, check it. Look, it is, I don't even know if you're ever going to see this. It is the literal question from whence number seven came. Like, this is the birth of the literal principle number seven. Okay, anyways, this is going to be exciting for me and one other person because this is really the absolute question that caused this idea. All right, cool. Because we actually fought over this. And I fought over this for an entire semester because people kept getting this one wrong and it was annoying. And I figured out why. And it was because of the way it was worded. So here we go. Here's how this, here's how this happened. I remember now. All right, C. Ask the client to help by assisting a wheelchair-bound client to a nearby elevator. All right, that is asking too much of a person. You can't do that. I don't know that just because they can walk doesn't mean that they're not a terrible person and wouldn't kick somebody down the stairs because they got scared, right? So that's a no-no. Open the closest fire doors so that ambulatory clients can evacuate more rapidly. <laughs> cool. Open the door that's got the hot stuff behind it. Yeah, no, that's 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 stupid. We're not going to do that. So again, here's how left, right, center came. The argument was, um, ask the client to help assist a wheelchair bound client to a nearby elevator versus remind the client to walk carefully down the stairs. And here's what we did. My student said, if you break it in three, all right, so we would say, remind the client to walk. That would be the left. Then we jump over to the right. We wouldn't even pay attention to the center yet. And I'll explain why we're doing this here in a second. Until reaching a lower floor is right. And then the center we have carefully down the stairs. Now, why is this important? This is important because we read this the first way through. Many or most of us, I would gather to say, based off of how much this has become a problem, 
have read it so many times and you're so tired of reading that you literally miss so much in a line. So if you do left, right, center and flip it around and you're stuck between two answers and can't do it, and they're worded really big like this, you can use left, right, center. What it does is it scrambles your brain and readjusts itself to look at it in a different way. Kind of like when your body's used to the same routine, the same walk that you always do at the gym, you'll plateau and stop losing weight. So what you have to do is trick your body into learning a new type of whatever. So you have to constantly change your routine. And what this does is it reworks a different type of muscle group, which then relearns what it needs to do to, you know, feed and feed and house um, that supply needed to, you know, keep it like it needs to be. So same principle applies here. Flip your brain around a little bit. Look at it differently. And then let's flip this one over. Ask the client to help. That's left. To a nearby elevator. Ooh, I just found something in that. By assisting a wheelchair-bound client. Okay, first off. This puts another person at risk. Ask the client to help. He might not be cool with it. He might not be able to handle another person. He might be incompetent. We don't know. We don't know. To a nearby elevator. Ain't there a fire? You don't go in an elevator when there's a fire. See, I didn't even pick that up until I did left, right, center. Because I, too, just flipped my brain and made it rework itself in a different fashion. And then assist a wheelchair-bound client. That's also a problem because if they're wheelchair-bound and they have to get through the elevator or something happens and they have to assist this person they don't know how to pick this person up out of a wheelchair and assist them to safety if something happens for whatever reason so we would never ask another person to do something regardless of how well they were doing period and then that leaves our answer over here which is remind the client to walk until they reach the lower floor that is that is standard see here we go again i didn't notice that either until we reach the lower floor, meaning until we get down to ground safety. And then in the middle, we have carefully down the stairs. So that's why this is the way it is. So remember this one. It's very important. All right, next slide. All right, so last slide before final thoughts. Left, right, and center is going to be our principle for this one. So an unlicensed assistant personnel places a client in the left lateral position prior to administering a soap suds enema. That's fun. Which instructions should the LPN provide the UAP? All right, cool. So first off, let's look at this. Position the client on the right side of the bed in reverse from Dellenberg. Oh boy, can you picture that cartoon in your head? I can. So hang on. Position the client on the right side of the bed in reverse from Dellenberg. So I've got them flipped to the right and flipped upside down. How is it going to work when I push all of that in there and it, uh, well, well, if you guys have ever done that before, think that's reverse gravity. We'll just put it that way. It's not going to work. That's reverse gravity. Okay, that's enough. We'll just, yeah, we'll strike that one for the record. Move on. Fill the enema container with a thousand milliliters of warm water and five milliliters of Castile soap. Okay, cool. Uh, although... Left, right, center is going to show you why that's a bad idea. And I just picked it up because I just did left, right, center in my head. Reposition in a Sims position with the client's weight on the anterior ilium. Ooh, that sounds good. Raise the side rails on both sides of the bed and elevate the bed to waist level. Yeah, and then you literally, why would you, both rails? But aren't you going to hurt your ribs? Because I've done that before on accident. Yeah, you crack your ribs real good on this side rail, so D isn't even going to be a thing. So that leaves C, which I really, really like, and then B, which I hate now that I know what I know, but before I did the left, right, center, I actually didn't know. So here we go, watch this. Fill the enema contain container, left, and five milliliters of Castile soap. Okay, we're going fine so far. With a thousand milliliters of warm water. All right, cool. I'm going to need for you guys to figure out what a thousand milliliters of water is. It is a liter of water. I want you guys to go to the nearest wherever and find a liter bottle and see the amount of fluid that is. That is an entire bag of fluid. That's a normal saline bag of fluid.
You're going to put that in my colon, that entire normal saline bag of fluid, that entire thing. What is that going to do? <laughs> like that poor mega colon on the inside is going to be dying on the inside. Literally. Yikes. That's too much. That's just too much. I would gather to say one quarter of that would be pushing it. Like, I don't even know how much is in a fleet because I can't really think about it right now. But if I had to guess, I would say anywhere from uh, mm, mm, 150 to 300 milliliters. It might even be smaller, but it most certainly is not 500, not even a liter. That's crazy. All right, cool. So then let's go over here. Reposition in a sim position. All right, Sims position, that is the white chalk outline position. All right, what does that mean, Molly? All right, cool. Just in case you don't remember, in the crime scene videos or crime movies that you watch, you always have this chalk outline of, <laughs> apparently this is Patrick Starfish, right? But they always have, like, this wonky arm that's like, kick, 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 kick. And that's how they are, and it's so weird, and I could never figure it out. But, you know, that's the Sims position, basically. You have... Legs sprawled out, you're leaning to the left, you're bearing weight on the anterior ilium, you were opening up that area to receive that amount of fluid, but not a thousand milliliters, not a thousand milliliters of fluid. Okay, cool. So left, right, center at its best way of explaining it, right in front of our face uh, in, in live form. So there you go. Uh, so let's talk about some final thoughts and then let's get the heck out of here and be done. All right, guys, that's the seven principles. Sorry, it took an hour. Final thoughts. Um, take a deep breath. Remember, if you remember nothing at all, remember principle one. That's going to get you through like 80% of the questions. Cool. The hard part is trying to find what everything has in common, which one's different. So the more you learn, the more you grow, and the ways you can learn is using your resources. Use your um, NCLEX question book. Use your Exit HESI book. You know, use all of the questions that you can, you know, find that are available in the back of all of your sections of your school books. Right? Make your uh, workshops with me because we go through these questions. We have an open forum where I do exactly what I'm doing with you right now. I just do it with everybody on there. And we blow through a lot more questions than what I can do um, now in this hour because I don't have to explain a whole bunch. I have to explain a whole bunch in the beginning. And then as we blow through them, we get used to them. We just, we're just rattling through them, just boom, 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 boom. And it is so incredibly successful. Um, so I hope to see you pretty soon with those. Um, also know that this is about finding the bare minimum nurse. You are far greater than the bare minimum of anything I've ever seen in my entire life. Don't you forget that. Because you can do this. If I can do this. If I can do this, oh boy, if I can do this, you can do this, right? Remember, I'm on the other side. I am what you're looking to hopefully be, and that's really cool. But don't forget, I am what you are right now. I used to be what you are right now in this moment. So we're no different. The difference is is I have jumped over to the other side. And you're nearly there. You're nearly there. So keep fighting. Don't give up. Don't let this test scare you. Don't let these haters hate. Don't let these people say, my brother's cousin, sister's uncle's nephew's second child, baby girl. She took that test 452 times and failed them all. And she was the smartest. Hang on. This is my best part. She is the smartest. I mean, seriously, this is the funniest, most ridiculous part that I ever hear in the end of all of these discussions. She was the smartest person I ever known. Girl, then what does that mean about you? That don't make no sense. You just dissed yourself and your sentence trying to diss me. And you think you got me, girl. No, you done got yourself.
and called yourself dumb. <laughs> Don't let these people get you. They will try to drag you down. There will always be someone trying to drag you down. And the smarter you get, and the harder you work, and the tougher you fight, and the deeper you dig down your heels, there's always going to be a person that's going to try to knock you off your block until that tower gets so reinforced with foundation that all they do is break their toe. So you keep kicking rocks in that direction and you build your foundation. One at a time. One at a time. And don't you stop until you get there. There's no feeling in the world like freedom. I mean true freedom. Where you don't have to worry about what anyone thinks, whether they're right or wrong. You don't have to worry because you're validated within yourself. That's the kind of freedom I mean. I drive in a Lambo or wearing a size zero <laughs> or whatever other stupid thing you think is important, right? Those are the real things that matter at the end of the day. Having validation within yourself, being your own ovation. I don't need a standing ovation. I am my own ovation. Be your own ovation. And when you take pride in yourself, the people around you will notice that pride and they'll want to do better just because they're a part of you. But until you decide to take that step, be better. And trust that you can be better and that you are better. You're one step behind from success. So catch up. Chin up. You got this. Go kill it. All right. I love you and I'm proud of you. Study well. And I'll see you in class.